Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. 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 Perfect. And you can see the screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So thank you, Paolo. So what I wanted to do today was talk to you a little bit about um, the work that we're doing to try and understand the overall community response to non-native species. And my work will be focusing on um, Hawaii, but also talking about stuff that we're, we're doing across other islands of the Pacific. And I should say that this is very much a collaboration with um, my graduate student, Natalie Graham, and Susan Kennedy and, Cran and Henrik Cranwinkel. Susan is a postdoc at Trier University and Henrik is a, an, a, as a, is a professor at, at Trier. So the, the point here, oops, sorry, just a sec. Um, the, the point here that, that I'm gonna really make is that there are many threats to the world's ecosystems. There's a complex mix of habitat destruction, climate change, disease, invasive species. And so we, we hear, you know, that all of these issues going on and, um, so, so, you know, there's all of these reports of animal species that are at the risk of extinction, the one million species going extinct, biodiversity loss accelerates. I mean, we've all heard these horror stories about what's going on, the insect apocalypse. Um, and, and, you know, they're very real. Now, the big thing is, what, how do we really understand this? In most places in the world, we don't have a kind of before and after. We don't have a, a time series through which we can look at how communities, whole communities change. So what the premise that we're coming from is that we need to understand the dynamics of, of communities in order to see how they're going to change. So what I'm going to focus on here is just how we might track biodiversity and ecosystem dynamics in a changing world. And so I'm going to focus initially on issues that are fairly just basic understanding of communities. And then I'll talk about how this informs us about ecosystem resilience to invasion. So first of all, understanding biodiversity dynamics. What's the island systems are really beautiful for understanding these dynamics because they allow insights first into the evolutionary processes. And we, we know this very well from the work of Charles Darwin and, and Wallace and um, that who, who were able to, to get insights into the evolutionary process, processes by, by comparing different islands. At the same time, you can look at communities and look at details of interactions. And by looking at islands of different age, you can see how community interactions change across space at one time period. And the real beauty of islands is that they provide a system in which you can actually link the two. So you can look at, at ecological processes at the same time as evolutionary process, processes. And so understand the dynamics of the entire system. And so what we've been doing is using this, to, this system to, and, and this kind of framework to understand diversification across the Hawaiian archipelago. So first of all, I know many of you know how Hawaii is arranged, but Hawaii is a hotspot archipelago. It's, the, the lava comes from, from beneath the ocean. It forms islands and the islands move away on the Pacific plate. So as a result, you get this chronological series of islands going from very young islands here, like on, on the big island, to older, to older, to the oldest on, on Kauai. So these islands provide a really beautiful time series for studying biodiversity dynamics. So what we have been doing is looking across the Hawaiian chrono sequence. And what we're, we're, we've chosen specific sites and these sites are the same elevation, same precipitation, same metrosiderous forest, but they differ in age. So what we've done then 
is go to these sites and we've got these quantitative assessment measures. We've, um, you see various people here, Andy, Andy Rominger is putting up a canopy malaise. Brendan is gonna go and clip branches. Natalie is beating certain plants and getting um, information on the arthropods that are associated with specific plants. So we use all of these methods of collecting. And the point here is to understand the entire community and then figure out how it's changing across the chrono sequence. Now, the thing is here, when you do this across multiple sites, multiple times of year, you end up with an awful lot of material. And this is basically what happened with us. You know, we ended up with just massive amounts of material. And so what we have been doing and what I'll focus on here is that we've been using quantitative meta barcoding, which is basically using genetic techniques for rapid biodiversity assessment. And right at the beginning, I should emphasize that this is absolutely not a substitute for taxonomy. It has to be married with taxonomy. It's a way to get ecological sampling rapidly in concert with doing taxonomic work. So what, what we do is we, we get these samples, we sort them to size, and I won't go into that, but it's, you need to do that in order to mitigate against amplification bias and so that you can get quantitative data. And then you extract sequences from pulled samples. And you can do this with or without destroying the samples. So what, what this allows you to do is it's not only just to get at the identity of the taxa, but it also it allows you to get at estimates, at least based on the genetic data, estimates of alpha diversity, relative abundances, cryptic diversity, separation of native and introduced taxa at some level, and also species interactions. I'll highlight in particular the importance of, of understanding and separating native and non-native species. The thing is, this is vital if we want to understand what the impact of non-natives is. We have to be able to separate them. They behave entirely differently. And we want to see how resilient, how resistant communities are to the impact of, of non-natives. So what we did was um, we looked at arthropods sampled across the Hawaiian archipelago. This is, again, Henrik work, working with Noriyuki Suzuki and Jeremy Anderson. And what you can do, and this is, it's still quite coarse, but it actually works remarkably well. But you can use the genetic signature to give you an indication of whether something is native or non-native. Because if something has been in the islands for a long period, like native species, you'd expect the genetic data to reflect that a million years of history versus, you know, in, in um, non-native species, you'd expect just long branches with no history reflected in the genetic data. So this is, these are what, these are the kind of approaches that we use. And so what are the hypotheses we can get at with, with this approach? I'm going to go to, to just through a few just to show you the kind of the power of, of this, this approach that is only just, we're only just kind of starting to realize. The first thing is that when you get island colonization, you expect, you know, and a new habitat opens up, and so things will colonize that, that new habitat. So you, the colonization is from outside, so there's ecological processes of immigration and colonization. Over time, you'll get the effects of, of evolution. So you'll get much, um, over, over time, that it'll be much less reflective of, immig from, of immigration from outside, but much more reflective of evolution within the system. So the predictions then are that genetic distances are going to be highest at the youngest sites because they're dominated by immigration. And so, so we expect that the youngest sites and decrease over time as evolution becomes dominant. What do you find when you look at the, the genetic data? You find exactly this pattern. It's really remarkable how consistent it is across our sampling. So here what you see is, is the youngest sites 
And you can see the genetic distances go from very high on the very young sites and they decrease roughly over, over age. We can't pick up the nuances as to what's going on on the older islands. I should emphasize also this is on a log um, scale. But the pattern is, of course, highly significant and um, it's, it really shows exactly what we expect. So we start to, to get some confidence in their approach. And so then the next hypothesis is that you would get increase in species diversity and richness over time, and that this will differ between lineages. So what are the expectations here? The predictions are, because we're sampling at single localities, like I said, we're, we're, so we're si sampling single sites, we expect that where taxa are going to, you're going to get multiple taxa where they occur multiple multiples at a site, like tetranathus spiders, you get multiple species co-occurring at, at any one site. So you would expect very rapid increase in diversity through this sampling protocol through, through the chrono sequence. In other groups where most of the divergence is allopatric or parapatric, like um, La Pala crickets, some are sympatric, but many of them are, are, are parapatric or allopatric. For those, you expect no increase in time just because of the method of sampling. You're sampling at a single site. They're increasing between sites. What do you find? And this is where it's really cool. What you find is actually for many of these arthropod groups, these are the ones you would expect to increase steadily through time because multiple species co-occur at a site. And for, so for spiders, beetles, flies, bugs, and, and, um, and moths and, moths and butterflies, that, that you, you get this steady increase, a very, um, there, these significant increase in diversity through time. And then when for lineages diverging between locations, like in the, the crickets, what you find here is that actually there's no difference. Um, they just kind of stay the same. The genetic diversity across sites at different ages stays basically the same. For other groups, we don't have enough information. Calambula, Hymenoptera, various other groups. What do they show? A lot of them still show this, in, this increase through time, suggesting that there's going to be multiple species at a site and they're just, um, the, the div w there's a lot more to do to understand how they're actually diversifying. Some like Calambula um, are just, they, they do not um, change through time, just like the Orthoptera. So this is one, one area that's where, where, where we can start to say, oh, you know, this actually makes sense. It actually tells us something. But the part I want to actually really highlight here is that you can actually pick up specialization through time. The specialization, you can look at um, average community-wide genetic distances and get predictable changes in ecological networks that measure the biotic associations among taxa. So you get, what, what you expect is that you get increasing interactions through time. And so this is, remember we were beating the vegetation, getting associations between the arthropods and the vegetation. What do you find? Here's the network we, get, we, we, we made from the community generated at the youngest sites. And you see, well, well, that looks like a network, but let's compare it to an older site. And you see there's much more diversity there. And this, for example, here, this, these are hemiptera, just to highlight what's going on. The youngest site here on the left, uh, that's the big island. Kauai is the oldest site, and you see many more interactions. Now, this is a very coarse way of looking at it. You can also look, there are many, many ways to look at networks. And so, Natalie Graham has been looking at this and trying to understand what, what's actually happening here. And so she's found these beautifully consistent um, patterns where you get decrease in connectance, increase in evenness, increase in vulnerability, decrease in nestedness, and increase in modularity through the chrono sequence. What does that mean in terms of the, the vulnerability or at least the resiliency of these communities 
to invasion. What I'm giving you here are just standard metrics and networks. What is really interesting here, I should mention that, you know, there's very obvious reasons as to why you get these changes. It's that the decrease in immigration through time, it results in the decrease in, in nestedness and the increase in modularity is associated with the specialization of taxa on the older islands. So how does this affect invasion? This is perhaps the most striking example. This, is, this, this just shows you ants on across the islands. And ants are entirely non-native to Hawaii. So the question here is how does community structure affect susceptibility to invasion? What you see here is that on the youngest substrates, there are far more ants. And then you get older, older. I mean, it's not, you know, there's still ants on, on Kauai. But the important thing is that you get many fewer on the older islands, far more at the younger sites. So older communities at least appear to be more resistant to invasion. So what we're doing is trying to build on this structure now, this, this way of examining the, the communities and trying to figure out exactly, well, what are the, the non-native species? What are the invasive species? Can, can we identify these and figure out what they're doing in these communities? And then figure out what aspect it is about the community, what network structures make them more resilient, and what can we do to actually address the issue. We're now, what in, as part of this effort, we've been expanding to other islands of the Pacific to see whether we can look at similar questions across the Marianas, the, the Ryukus, and um, this is work that um, is being, being done with colleagues, Evan Okonoma in Okinawa and Holger Rogers, who works in Guam. And this has been really led by Susan Kennedy, who's at Trier University. So the primary hypothesis here, looking across the, the, the Pacific Islands, is that invaded communities, all else being equal, invaded communities should be more homogeneous than native. So Susan's been looking across the Hawaiian Islands and um, the Ryukus, which is where Okinawa is, and where Evan Economo is based, and the Marianas, where Holger Rogers is based. And so I'm just going to give you very preliminary data. She's still, Susan is still working hard and figuring out what it's telling us, but there's some really intriguing results when you compare across these archipelagos. First, you know, you might think there'd be some similarities between, between the different islands, especially, you know, in terms of invaded species, invasive species. What you find is there's actually very little overlap, whether native or non-native sites, they are, there's very little overlap. And so if we look at this more closely, what do you see? Here, it's, it's really quite cool. This is intact sites or native sites. And you see the overlap, where, where, where you get the overlap, there are very few taxa, but the sites that don't overlap with anything, you know, the native sites with the, with the non-native and the, the, the different island systems, the, the important thing is that Every site appears to have its own almost entirely unique set of biota. And you look at degraded sites, our hypothesis was that they, these would be more similar um, across the, you know, the, the islands and the de degraded sites, but that's actually not true at all. And what, what Susan has also been doing, which is really intriguing, is using spiders as kind of indicators of the of the communities and they they actually reflect the arthropod community if you look at the spider gut content it tells you a lot about the community of arthropods in that system and so she's been able to use that information to have another indicator of what the the differences are between the different islands and also show that the diet of the spiders is entirely different in these, these different island systems, whether you're looking at degraded or intact sites. So in conclusion here, this is all very much a work in progress, but what, we've, what I've shown is that using remote archipelagos and metabarcoding, we can start to capture the dynamics of biodiversity during community assembly. 
Biodiversity clearly increases initially from immigration, later by speciation, and patterns of accumulation differ between lineages. You get much more specialization on older islands. So we can recover these patterns through metabarcoding. The other thing is that older communities seem to be more res resilient to invasion, while younger communities are ecologically open. Now, remember, we're looking at sites that are largely intact. And so this, is, this was in order to give us an estimate of just whether we could recover this signal. We clearly can. And so we can go on to explore more invaded sites and try and understand the dynamics within different, different kinds of sites. Novel species interactions are driven by the recent introduction of non-native taxa, and this can have a rapid effect on ecological network properties, and we can clearly see that. And finally, there's little overlap in community composition between archipelagos in either native nor, nor intact sites. So the important thing here is that we need approaches like I've been showing you here to understand what's going on in these different systems. So with that, I just want to thank all of the people that have been involved in this work and still are very much involved in this work. And in particular, um, I'll highlight here Henrik Kranwinkel, Natalie Graham and Susan Kennedy, who really provided um, almost all the data for this, for this work. And um, yeah, thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Rosemary, for this uh, very impressive uh, talk. Uh, we uh, now I will start uh, sharing my presentation to get in time. One moment. Okay. Okay, I hope everyone is seeing it. I will move. Okay. Okay, I will move. Uh, I will talk about uh, arthropod decline in the Azores and also the role of exotic species, as uh, Rosemary uh, mentioned, for uh, Pacific Islands. Um, uh, I will divide this presentation in three parts. Uh, talk a little bit about patterns of insect decline worldwide, then uh, presenting the results from the Azores, and some ideas for uh, future uh, uh, research. Okay, uh, as Rosemary mentioned, we have, are observing a kind of uh, uh, massive decline of some groups of insects in many ecosystems uh, with uh, uh, some recent reviews uh, pointing out many uh, alarming situations in uh, mostly in northern uh, Europe uh, and America where there is plenty are already some plenty of that but possibly these trends are common in other parts of the world. Uh, there is a recent uh, article about uh, what is happening in Germany uh, agroecosystems with uh, uh, demonstration that this uh, the, uh, reduction of uh, diversity of course uh, is occurring in uh, dramatically in some uh, agroecosystems and importantly this decreasing in biomass and diversity is occurring both in abundant and in the rare species. That is, is occurring through all the species rank uh, abundance in the communities, which is quite impressive. Okay, based on these um, on these trends, uh, we decided in the Azores to perform also a long-term uh, study. Um, and we call this the SLAM project, Long-Term Ecological Study of the Impacts of Climate Change in Natural Forests of the Azores. Um, and uh, we started in 2012. 
uh, we are already with eight years of that and uh, uh, there we have some uh, key objectives for in a way to respond to the Wallacean and Prestonian shortfalls to know more about the spatial distribution and abundance in this case in temporal scales uh, identify key biodiversity erosion drive, drivers impacting oceanic uh, native uh, faunas um, and uh, try to and identify also uh, the environmental change related with the distribution and abundance of species uh, contributing of course to understand the insect decline stories in islands uh, uh, to contributing to the red list status of Azorian endemic arthropods and uh, in a way get that also to to collect uh, these patterns we, uh, in three levels of diversity taxonomic functional and phylogenetic and collect these with ecosystem functions of course most of these uh, aims are not yet a shift but we probably have that to to go to this we selected uh, many sites in uh, different towns of the Azores I will show only now uh, the stories for 10 sites in the native pristine forests of the Sarah Island in in high elevation pristine forests and we use these slum traps in which we uh, every three months we collect the data uh, from uh, between 2012 and 2024 we had uh, i'm leading this project uh, we we had few people helping me in field work but about but we had about 34 students uh, with grants from erasmus and neurodesign that in the last nine years are helping me uh, to sort all this material uh, to species. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of work on training also. And in a way, I'm solving also the uh, taxonomy impediment, training these students to learn uh, to separate insects at morphospecies uh, and please. We got in the, uh, and uh, till 24, we get around 350,000 euros in many different projects to support this work. And uh, we have three publications so far on this uh, eight year work, but probably, but of course, many more will come. The first, uh, going very fast to the first um, uh, results. Uh, the first very interesting result uh, from a research of a master thesis of a French student that is finishing now his thesis is that uh, we have high diversity in autumn this is for indigenous species of arthropods we have a consistent high diversity every year in autumn consequence of high temperature in the summer therefore uh, insects respond to temperature and of course there is a delay in the response of the community and then in autumn between september and december we observe the high uh, metrics of diversity consistently this is for native but see the amazing result for exotics uh, okay this is uh, the conclusion that diversity sensors of arthropods uh, increase uh, uh, with temperature but look for exotics a chaotic situation of course, exotics are not responding uh, in the same way because they enter, they go out, they, ex they have a more dynamic situation. They are not in equilibrium with these forests. Therefore, we have a fantastic pattern for native species and a chaotic pattern for uh, exotic species, which is amazing result and showed uh, how uh, exotics are still evolving in the system and not adapted to the system. Then we look for temporal dynamics of native and exotic species in uh, this system. 
and we had some predictions. We predict that temporal beta diversity will be greater for greater for uh, higher for uh, exotic species, uh, and that uh, as a consequence, uh, based on theory of Alan Bajorafi uh, adapted for exotics, uh, that colonization rate will be also higher and excision rate. Uh, for uh, higher for than excision rate for non native species. Okay. And as expected, we have high beta diversity for non native species in this system. They are in a high dy dynamism in this system. They are entering now the, this uh, pristine native forest and with high temporal dynamism in the system and native species with lower. Uh, better diversity. Uh, then the question uh, that comes out is uh, is uh, insect um, insects declining in this uh, system are as we observe in agroecosystems in northern Europe are what is happening in the um, in the this system okay then uh, we have some predictions here as, uh, as uh, most of these uh, traps uh, sample mostly cannot be arthropod species and uh, we know from pre previous work that these communities are mostly dominated by endemic species we expect that uh, if there is a decrease in abundance of arthropods the endemic species will be the most affected uh, in this canopy system. Uh, and since exotic species are more dynamic in space, as we showed before, and time, we also expect some temporal positive signal for this group of species. What we observed is that uh, the only real signal is for exotic species. Exotic species diversity is increasing through time. Uh, uh, there is no signal, real signal for natives and endemics, but amazingly, exotic species are increasing in diversity through time, which is not a good news. Uh, but because these forests are still very well preserved, if you look to them, there is a very uh, interesting communities of native plants, bri bryophytes, lichens very luxuriant vegetation, but unfortunately exotic species are coming from the surrounding matrix of agricultural system and are starting building up community. And indeed, uh, if we use the hill numbers, this is very clear for exotic species, this uh, uh, increase of diversity. If we go uh, analyzing species uh, per species, and we look for the slope of relationship between abundance and years for species being present in more than four years. The, uh, we have uh, 60, uh, we have only 63 species where we could do some statistical analysis. Um, and in this case, on average, the slope are negative uh, for uh, in the majority of endemic species. Uh, and, but for some exotic species, we have um, already some um, uh, increase of um, abundance and for some endemic also, there is already some variation with decrease of uh, abundance. But this signal is very still very poor. We don't have really, uh, species by species, we don't have real uh, strong statistical thing. Probably we need more time to do that. Uh, in general, as we showed before, uh, beta diversity is higher for, exot for exotic species, clearly it's a, a consistent signal through all the analysis. Uh, and this is clearly important. And if we look to species abundance distribution through time, we see that exotics are uh, in 2013, we have mostly of the exotic species are uh, singletons, but through time you see that we start building more, and in 2018 we have more exotic species being uh, 
uh, with higher rank in octave uh, plots here. Therefore, exotics are building up in these communities in a very short period of time. Is uh, this is uh, eight nine years, uh, and of course we are seeing also uh, that vegetation is changing a little bit with the entrance of Edicum gardnerian, the invasive plant that is common in Hawaii also, and it's changing the communities, and probably this is a consequence also of that. that therefore. Some key measures are finally pointing to ways in which the study of turnover can be adapted for future applications in habitat islands and in islands. Uh, of course, the, there is a high stochastic turnover for exotic species that are still building up in these communities. And we need a very efficient way to deal with sourcing dynamics in these. Uh, uh, fragmented native forests surrounded by a matrix of uh, human uh, intensive agricultural systems. Of course, then uh, we got in a group of scientists that tried to find a roadmap to, for insect, insect conservation and recovery. We published that uh, last year. And of course, the solution is to find a multi way to deal with this uh, situation. Uh, of course, the European Union is trying to decrease the pesticides and all these inputs of herbicides and all these things. Uh, we have to increase, of course, um, controls on imports to islands in, uh, uh, in control better uh, the way uh, uh, we uh, avoid the entrance of uh, insect pests in islands. In the Azores, we are, uh, uh, we are finding that uh, in some situations, uh, termites and ants are coming with uh, products, uh, uh, food products and uh, wood and this kind of things. Uh, we have to, to um, uh, invest more in conservation of native habitats educate better different kind of stakeholders and uh, doing monitoring is very important. Therefore, in these global monitoring programs that uh, uh, Rosemary showed and we are doing here also in the Azores, these are very important to understand these uh, patterns. We proposed uh, a, a global island monitoring scheme uh, to islands uh, for different groups of biota, uh, and uh, we need indeed to ex expand this kind of studies to other uh, island systems and to understand uh, how human activities are uh, impacting uh, habitats, and we need to manage this very carefully. We got now in the Azores uh, one life project for uh, beetles, these life beetles, that was a very important uh, project, is a very important project to start improving some of these habitats and deal with these uh, exotic species dynamics. And this is a good start to have good money, important money from European community to deal with invertebrate conservation. It's a, it is a very good thing from your uh, strategy for European community. I want to thank uh, for my colleagues that uh, cl uh, are collaborating in addition to the students uh, in this project, like Thomas Matthews, Francois Rigal, and Pedro Cardoso that are helping me in the analysis of this data. And of course, all the students that in the last eight years are giving their, their effort to, to process all these uh, data. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And now I will give the flower to Soronov and then we can start with questions after that.
uh, and unmute your sound of sort of not. Uh, uh, no, your sound is closed, I think. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Paul, for, uh, for this. Um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not 100% well fit because uh, yesterday I got my second doses of the vaccine. So I have uh, uh, some kinds of symptoms like I, I had, uh, I get a flu. So, but once we talk about insects and uh, ecology, biology of insects, so uh, I'm, I'm happy. To, uh, to over, I, I can get overcome this uh, this problem. So, I w my my presentation is to is to um, give you some sense of uh, um, uh, some research we developed over the last uh, over the last uh, years. Uh, my presentation is when a powerful invade does not become established uh, on highlands. I I, I imagine that uh, everybody is aware that. Uh, Ammoniac cirrhosis is a, a very interesting biological model to understand the, the reasons why insects can be very prone uh, to invade uh, uh, new uh, new uh, habitats. So this is a this is a, a, a picture of global distribution of ammoniac cirrhosis. So the native areas is uh, is, uh, is represented here, but. Since the 60s, the, 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 the harmonia started to spread all over the world. Uh, till now, we know that in two parts of the world, the species is uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not present. So, is a species uh, very um, successful in terms of colonizations and spread all over the world. So, on the last year, we have tried to understand why Hermodax series did not yet establish in the in some spots uh, of uh, of the globe, there is some cases where harmonia uh, uh, did not thrive to find maybe the conditions to uh, to uh, uh, to adapt or to colonize. And uh, this is more surprising because uh, during uh, several years, almost ten years, harmonia cirrhosis was uh, introduced in several highlands, uh, of course for uh, for uh, purpose of uh, biological control program once uh, the species is very aggressive against pests so it's a, a very nice uh, tool uh, for integrate pest man management and as well for biological control so uh, during the 80s and the 90s thousand and thousand individuals were released some uh, some uh, in some cases the release was only for study the impact in the, against aphids for instance in specific cultures or crops as uh, as cornfield so the idea is uh, in general all the uh, all the colleagues that worked in invasion biology are trying to find the reason why it's so successful in my case so uh, i'm trying to contribute in order to understand why uh, ammoniac suede in some cases was not so successful. This is the case, for instance, in Canary Highlands that uh, she already was recorded, but uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, according to my last information, the species is not a problematic there. Very recently, we found some individuals in Madeira Highlands, so uh, two years ago, so we are a little bit um, uh, interesting to see uh, the trend of this population uh, there in Madeira, Madeira Island. On the first place, we try to test uh, three hypotheses. Uh, one of the hypotheses uh, uh, that predict the existence of species rich community in the areas might prevent population growth. So we expected, for instance, in community with, uh, with um, close related species, uh, uh, close related species uh, um, uh, are absent, so uh, probably because uh, we can find some uh, empty niches and relaxed competition, so the species can be more prone to invade, contrary to places, for instance, this Central Europe, where co occurring species similar from an ecological point of view are present. So we expected that the negative correlation between species recent uh, species richness of recipient habitats and invasion success. We are we as well tested the second hypothesis 
so we, we take the, the naturalization hypothesis by Daring, uh, stating the existence of close competitors, uh, namely similar size and ladybirds, may also prevent ladybirds. In this case, we should expect, that, for instance, that Azores could be more prone because of the absence of uh, intra-guild uh, interactive competitors or intra-guild uh, uh, predators uh, 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 species. So we expect as a positive correlation between body weight difference between harmoniac cirrhosis and invasion uh, success of hormonic. A third hypothesis uh, um, proposed by uh, Davis 2009 uh, uh, states as appropriate resource, namely aphids, may be insufficient in oceanic islands despite being generalist. Uh, Armoni is a very generalist and polyphagous species, as, as you know. This, uh, this figures here at the bottom of the slides depict a little bit what we should expect from ocean islands. Small habitats, fragmented, with a low biodiversity of food resource compared to continental uh, islands. So in this case, we expect a positive correlation between resource availability and invasion success. So, so this is uh, more or less the strength of the forces we expected testing the hypothesis uh, I mentioned before. So we expect in solar habitat will be less species richness in coccinids than in continental habitat. So more prone to accept uh, uh, these big uh, uh, invaders. And insular uh, habitats dominated by ladybirds smaller in body size to harmoniac cirrhosis and therefore poor intergrid predations, we can expect it to better receive a new species in the, in the uh, uh, new habitats. And finally, low resource availability compared with continental Europe, therefore leading to a failure, a failure of uh, the species to successes invade uh, Azores. So we undertake a, 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 a huge uh, sampling program and we try to compare two places, Azores, where uh, the species did not uh, thrive, and with the Czech Republic uh, uh, as um, a proxy of uh, what happened in Central uh, Europe. So we sample uh, similar habitats, crops, uh, herbs and trees in the two uh, uh, places, despite the small differences on uh, methodology, but uh, we, um, we assess the uh, richness of uh, ladybirds community. And uh, we tested uh, whether the proportion of abundance of, uh, of the beetles was similar between regions to be able to conclude that the data from the two methods were comparable. So we set uh, a, a, a latitudinal uh, transects from the north of Europe uh, starting in Denmark and we, uh, we came to the south of Italy. So we selected seven uh, spots to, uh, to, uh, to sample. Because we knew that uh, in general, uh, the ladybirds are one actually really thrive better in the northern north part of Europe, contrary to the south of Europe in Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean areas. So I will not, uh, we can discuss the, 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 the results we, we get because we compare species richness, we compare the availability of food resource using, we using the community organized as a body weight uh, uh, compositions of, in terms of body weight of the community as a proxy of, uh, of um, uh, available, availability of uh, food in these uh, regions. So what we found uh, in testing this three hypothesis was, was uh, um, um, that uh, the, uh, our data uh, is contrary to diversity invisibility hypothesis, so does not, do not follow the predict negative correlations. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the species uh, thrive better in habitats with the big uh, ladybird beetles and with the with cool uh, uh, co-occurring and uh, uh, very, uh, very close related uh, species. So we do not follow the predict positive correlation. So uh, there was a close, uh, uh, close to significance for difference in the body mass. So contrary to naturalization cycle, so we did, we did not uh, uh, find, uh, we did not find uh, data to um, uh, to uh, um, agree with the, with this hypothesis. Finally, uh, follow the expected positive correlation and agree with the resource availability hypothesis. So, 
in general, uh, we, uh, we found that uh, put all this hypothesis uh, together and only considering the three hypotheses simultaneously, we were able to fully understand the mechanism promoting or preventing the success of more uh, uh, invasion, uh, successful invasion by ammonia series. Then in the first place, the main factor seems to be the absence of resource uh, availability. And, and the second, the Darwin naturalization hypothesis, the second factor is determinant to the, so, uh, to the success of invasive species. This is a very interesting because the trend we found in deserts is very similar, for instance, in the south of Europe. For instance, in the last uh, uh, spot of Europe we sampled, so in the south of Italy, we found a community of ladybird beetles composed by uh, very important ladybirds that are almost absent in the north part of Europe. This is very, uh, is very uh, abundant, is very important. So very small ladybird beetles, a skin species, so like, like a 1.5 milligrams of body weight. So this represents almost 35% of local community is, uh, of course, is less than in, in the Azores because our communities almost represent 90% of this type of, of ladybird. So apparently very, um, very low capability to uh, compete with, for instance, with herbonia activities. But anyway, this is, was not the reason apparently for the uh, insuccess of harmonia activities. Finally, we uh, try to see uh, 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 what climate conditions of the Azores could have contributed to restrict the establishment and spread of harmonia activities. So, of course, our intention using the max scent was in first place to identify the suitability of uh, the geographic area for harmonia axiridae in the second uh, uh, place to, uh, to try to find what variables could uh, can explain this unsuitability of harmonia axiridae. It's, it's interesting because we generate uh, a, a model uh, uh, using data of four different populations. First, European population because in the 80s was the first population that was brought to the resource and try to introduce, and it it failed to uh, to uh, it failed to uh, adapt in the resource. We uh, uh, we make our model as well by using uh, data for U.S. population because you know uh, we know that is the most invasive population uh, uh, on the world. Indeed, the big uh, the big uh, boom of the population in Europe came from a population that was reintroduced. Uh, in uh, Europe, uh, several uh, uh, years after after the first uh, the first attempt to introduce the species uh, in uh, Europe, indeed, this uh, U U.S. population was uh, was a population that as well invaded the South America. We use as well data of native A uh, Asian populations. That was the first population introduced in Europe, and the first researchers that uh, picked that population here uh, to the Azores. Uh, 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 use it uh, very uh, in the first place. Almost the first population come from native uh, native population. And in addition, we generate what we call it a global niche using the world data set uh, as a proxy of potential of population in uh, in general. So in so we generate uh, maps of uh, suitability. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, the global niche uh, here represents predicts suitability in all islands, mainly in San Miguel, San Jorge and Peak, however less than uh, 0.5 uh, with a high degree of uh, uncertainty. Uh, in relation to the native uh, uh, niche, despite to be uh, very unsuitable in, in, in general, but it was a little bit for poor, for peak, Fayal and San Jorge. And Europe was higher in Fayal, uh, in Fayal uh, Island, Pico Graciosa and San Jorge. This is interesting because when we try to sort uh, the specific uh, uh, factors on uh, um, explaining this insuccess, it was very uncertain. It was not clear uh, uh, what specific factors or specific factors were on the base of this uh, uh, this uh, this result. However, the temperature emerged in general as important 
uh, important uh, factor. Uh, I want to stress that it was the most uh, explanatory, uh, explanatory variables, uh, in particular annual mean temperature and mean uh, diurnal uh, temperature, isothermality and mean temperature of the coldest mass, uh, months. However, the first two, as, uh, as we expected a little bit uh, uh, some uh, uh, on the basis of this explanation, is very similar to the, the region, subtropical regions where harmonious introduced a successful. However, isothermality and mean temperature, uh, temperature for the coldest months, we can see big differences, especially the mean temperature of the coldest months. For instance, the Hazors uh, have a, a positive, positive temperature of nine degrees in the coldest months is in February, and in the Vedan regions, where uh, Hermonia was successful, the uh, temperature is more or less zero uh, degrees. Zero degrees is very important uh, key uh, factor, key abiotic factor that explain, for instance, the uh, overwintering strategy of the species. Indeed, the species do not survive outside of the range of minus five degrees and more than five degrees, positive degrees. So the suitable temperature for overeating strategy is zero degrees. So high levels of mortality through desiccations or, or, or spending, uh, uh, spending the reserves, fat reserves, is uh, uh, already uh, being demonstrated in Canadian population as well in West Palearctic uh, regions of Europe. So the question is, does temperature in the Azores remain winning the range of required values for, uh, to sustain? Harmoniax readers diapose for three, six months? Of course not. Uh, uh, only uh, one highlands can offer this type of conditions over, uh, uh, over uh, uh, 1,200 meters, what is of course only uh, in peak. So, the uh, monthly uh, mean daily uh, temperatures only goes below freezing point at this uh, part of, uh, of, uh, of the island, but for very, very short uh, time. So usually this is, uh, the, this is conditions that very quickly uh, uh, finish. And of course, what is, what is the problem? Is Harmoniac series is trying to find this spot to overwinter in the case of, of, um, of the silence. The problem is the cessation of overwintering. So if this happen, because the temperature in general, after this uh, period, typically, typically uh, occur uh, in the key sense period in another part of the world, so temperature is go, uh, uh, goes below uh, minus five degree, in this time here, the temperature is was uh, uh, would be more than 10 uh, degrees. So we expected that the onset, the onset of key essence. So this is problematic because uh, uh, special females uh, would start to find uh, resource food to start to build up the first generations and no uh, no food resources was available to supply the needs of the species. So uh, we expected high mortality rate before even to build uh, the first generation. So uh, females to uh, uh, lay the first, uh, the first things. It, it's interesting because in Azores we can find, for instance, some aphids in some plants, usually uh, uh, pla exotic plants, but the colony of aphids are very small and uh, represent, uh, uh, represented by colonies that are not enough to supply even, uh, even a very demanding resource uh, females uh, uh, who, need to, uh, to, uh, who need a lot of resource to lay these apes. In summary, our study support hypothesis according to each abiotic conditions as a climate may represent an important barrier uh, to the invasion process. And that this may depend on the origin of the population that supporting the biotic resistance hypothesis for the failure of invasions. Okay, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you.